Alright guys and gals, and a happy Halloween! This is a long plane review for Cauldron on the Amstrad CPC, released by Palace Software in 1985. And this is my special Halloween video for the year, and what better game than the legendary Cauldron? It's also one either, shall I say, put off doing for a long time because those of you who've followed me for uh, some time know that I'm not a big fan of the Cauldron series especially its sequel. Neither am I a fan of the platforming in this game with its design of how you're supposed to know in advance where to blindly jump off every flick screen as this clip from my weekly Amstream live stream recently where I've played Cauldron for the first time in years aptly demonstrates what a first time experience of Cauldron is often like for most people. Here we go. Oh. What is this bullcrap game design? Right. So this this immediately annoys me. Right, so you have a single screen. You have a single screen platformer, right? Okay. <laughs> and you move from one screen to the next. And it starts you on the next screen with an empty space and immediately kills you. Why is this game design? Why is this game design? That! Why is that a thing? Right, I'm, gonna, I'm turning into the angry video game nerds, but like stuff like that just like boils my... You're in. Like, unless you've played the game before, I know that's going to happen. I can't, it's, like, it's like Rick Dangerous crap level crap, but worse. What? That's even worse. That's even worse. That is even worse. That's just trolling. Not only does it. Not only does it. Like. <laughs> not only does it like. It puts a bloody platform. Just to troll you above where you come onto the screen and still drops you to your bloody doom. <laughs> oh, I need to learn it, do I, Vello? That's how these platformers are. Sorry. To be fair, I think this is actually the final room actually supposed to go to. All right. Okay. Now, 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 what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump right onto the next screen. And I guarantee you I will jump, right? And I bet you dollars to donuts that I'll jump. And there won't be a platform like uh, the a space. I bet you there won't be a platform there, and the platform will be literally as I walk onto the screen, and I'll fall to my doom. Watch what happens. The platform's there this time. The the platform's there this time. If I just walked, if I just walked off the screen, I would have survived. I knew it. I freaking knew it. If I didn't jump, if I just walked off the screen like I'd done the previous two times, it would I would have survived. But this this time, 
I jumped. I died. <laughs> Game's trolling me already. I'm already triggered. I'm already freaking triggered. Okay, all right, as well. I've just learned something. You don't move with the lift. If you stand still on the lift, you don't move with the lift, okay? Okay. So, yeah, there you go. I don't think there's any other game on the Amstrad that makes me as angry as Cauldron 1 or 2. And, yes, there are big issues with the game design in this one. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. But now we've got that out of the way and you know what to expect. You'll understand just how freaking difficult a game Cauldron is and how excruciatingly painful this was to beat and to get done in under a week in time for Halloween today. But before we start, let's read out the excellent manual from the game which tells us the story and what we have to do, which they done in rhyme rather cleverly. And here we go. Harken witches everywhere, take the challenge if you dare. Tomorrow night tis Halloween, where only one shall be witch queen. Six ingredients thou must take, and in the cauldron boil and bake. Juice of toad, eye of newt, wing of bat, hemlock root. Mouldy piece of splintered bone, found from deep in musty tomb. Molten lava cooled a while, taken from the smoking aisle. Then the spell shall be at hand, to rid the pumpkin from the land. So play a game of high adventure, hold control and then press enter. <laughs> very good, very nice end there to uh, load the game up. So there are actually eight items in total, not six, for the witch to collect. Six of them are ingredients uh, for the witch to conjure in her cauldron to, to defeat the Pumpkin King and collect the Golden Broom. The other two are special items that allow you to collect two of the six ingredients, but we'll come to that in a bit. Anyway, this is going to be a long one, so let's start this off. Okay, and we're playing the uh, disc version here, uh, released on cassette as well. Cassette release was uh, £8.99, that was the average full price at the time. Nice loading screen here, lovely uh, Mode 1 graphics. And here we are on the title screen with a very atmospheric tune. It's quite a short short tune actually that does loop around um, fairly quickly. We'll let it play for about um, two loops before we uh, get into the game. Um, some credits there. Two credits. Richard uh, Leinfellner on uh, coding duties. Also did the coding for the Commodore 64 version. We'll talk more about him and uh, the designer here, Steve Brown. Copyright Palace software. Uh, Palace are also known for their um, home video releases. Um, Maybe familiar them releasing a lot of horror movies back in the day. Uh, I knew them, of course, for releasing the uh, Evil Dead movies. I think the um, ZX Spectrum release of Cauldron got um, the Evil Dead game released on the B side of the cassette um, to help boost sales. Um, although a lot of shops at the time were a little bit reluctant of stocking that, um, worried about um, Video Nasties, which uh, Evil Dead, the movie, was uh, famous for being a video nasty at the time. Um, but a lot of kids are like quite excited about the Evil Dead and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, cool tune here. Very atmospheric. Kind of wish you had more of these kind of tunes in-game, which we don't get, sadly. Anyway, let's kick things off here. Nice little animation there of the witch stirring the cauldron there as she leaves her cottage. And a nice little smoke plume coming out the cottage there. We're going to leave that key for now because that will become handy later on. Oh, we just hit about there and lost 10% of our magic. You can see the magic level there at the top left of the screen there. And lovely Mono graphics. And we fly flick screen between, um, yeah, as she flies on a, a witchy broom. 
and nice mode split actually mode one at the top for score lives and uh number of, yeah and uh scroll at the scrolls there and the score and the magic level we're going to land here you can only land in certain places where there's like a little clearing and a flat space on the floor that's very important there's a little magic magic portal there to restore a magic level just gonna kill a few bats there and then restore a magic level we just picked up a key there Um, it's important to note the other versions of Cauldron, the, the uh, keys are colour-coded for certain coloured doors. On the Amstrad version, the keys are not colour-coded. Uh, we'll, come, we'll come to different uh, the differences between the versions in a little bit. Uh, but we're going to pick up this key here. Um, and there's kind of like a logical route I'm following here. Um... There are there are a couple of long plays on YouTube. I watch I've seen I watch both. Um, uh, one of them seems to be the quicker route through the game, so I've kind of followed that one. Anyway, um, we're gonna come to our first dungeon here. Now there are four. I call them dungeons. Some people call them crypts or chambers or whatever. And here's the first one here. There are four dungeons, but actually really three of them are the... There's only three you're really going to have to visit to collect items in the game. We've just picked up the first item there, which is the frog. Or toad. Um, <clears throat> and there's another item there, which we can't reach from, this, uh, from going this way. Um, we'll have to get it on the way out. By going looping all the way around the uh, dungeon here, and this is where the problems are, are are apparent in the game, which will come to shortly. So there's like three main dungeons where the items are. The fourth dungeon is essentially where the end of level boss is, end of game boss. Sorry, the pumpkin king, and the final item, the golden broom. But you can't confront the final boss, the Pumpkin King, until you've collected all six items. Well, actually, technically eight. I'll come to that in a second, why there's eight. Um, when you've mixed all six items in your cauldron in your witchy cottage, then you can confront, confront the Pumpkin King and kill him, and then you can collect the golden broom, and the game is won. So I said there were six items. There's actually eight. So let me just get my notes here. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier. So uh, just to repeat what I was saying earlier, there are actually eight items in total. Um, um, where's my notes? Just going to scroll through here. Um, oh, crap. I've lost where I made a note here. All right, I found where I said it. Right, so it's important things to note here. So the chest is required to pick up the bones, right? And the urn is required to pick up the lava. The problem is the chest and the lava are both in the like volcano dungeon. And both the urn and bones are in the graveyard dungeon. So, of course, logically, that means one of those dungeons will have to be visited and traversed fully twice. Sadly, the urn and the chest are not located at the start of either, so you can't just pop in, grab it, and then leave quickly. So, okay, so just to repeat that, right, the chest is required to pick up the bones, and the urn is required to pick up the lava. The problem is the chest and the lava are both in the volcano dungeon. And both the urn and the bones are in the graveyard dungeon. So it means one of those dungeons will have to be visited and traversed fully twice. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> Which means that, that the Amstrad version is probably the longest of the three versions of Cauldron to complete. So Cauldron appeared on the uh, Spectrum Commodore 64 and Amstrad. And the Amstrad take is is the longest one to complete, quite by a significant margin. I think the Spectrum and the Commodore sixty four versions you can complete in about twenty to twenty five minutes. The Amstrad version um, takes nearly an it takes nearly 
50, 50 minutes to an hour. Actually, maybe 45 to 50 minutes or something like that. So, yeah. Um, and that's because on the Amstrad version, they've made it a little bit harder and longer by making you have making you having to repeat one of the dungeons because of this um because of this thing i think on the uh, spectrum of commodore 64 version the urn to collect the like the lava you can collect it at the start of a dungeon and then just pop out again anyway well we just did this first like dungeon fairly quickly which is quite good um but um I've got to be honest with you here, guys. Um, we didn't talk about the problems with the flick screen in the dungeon there. Um, I made that look quite simple. How I did that dungeon is, thank God, for CPC Power website with a map of the dungeon. And I'm not talking about like a hand-drawn map that someone's made. Um, I'm talking about someone's taking a screenshot of every um, room of that dungeon and pieced it together. <clears throat> and every um, in every room, basically, what I've done is um, as I've en uh, as I've entered each room, or about to enter each room, or just about to exit um, each screen, is I paused the game, looked very carefully. <laughs> at this screenshotted map on CPC Power and looked where the next platform is on the next screen. I've had to just reverse here and get magic back. Um, I need to make sure I've got full magic before going to this next location um, as much as I can. Sorry. And I've had to look at the map and study where where's the next platform going to be before I leave the screen. That's how I've done it. Right, here, I need to collect this key just quickly. I need to try and make sure I've got as much health as possible or magic. I'll come back to what I'm talking about in just a second. Damn it. I want to try and enter this dungeon with as much magic as possible. Oh, will that lava get me? Uh, now, these lavas, if they hit me, take about, I think they take about 20% off your health. Actually, it's seventy one percent down to forty six percent. That took about. Hmm. I think I'm not sure. I think you can fly away, and if you open, if you use a key and open a door, I think you can fly away and get health or magic, and then come back, and the dungeon is still unlocked. I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but I think you can. But I'm, uh, I wasn't hundred percent sure. And I didn't have enough time to sort of test that out and get this recording done to be uh, out for Halloween. So I thought, oh, sod it, I'll risk it. So, yeah, here, what I'm doing is... Right. As I'm about to leave here, I'm pausing, studying the, the map, and seeing where, I'm, where I need to jump. So, like, here, I would pause the game here, look at the map, and see where, where I need to jump. That's how I'm doing, getting through this long play, boys and girls. Secrets of the trade I'm giving away here. <laughs> uh, without that screenshotted map, uh, this would be utterly impossible. I mean, the game gives you nine lives. You can see at the top uh, right of the screen there, you've got nine hags. I mean, and also looking at, um, there's like a couple of long plays on YouTube, so I have that for reference as well, and looking and, and watching and seeing what they did in their long plays, so thank you. Uh, there's Axelino, there's Amstrad Maniaki as well. I think he was using snapshot reloads and clever editing in his video and stuff. It, uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, hey, what the hell? Um, but yet without that map from CPC Power and careful zooming in and studying of like pausing, seeing where to jump. I mean, how would you know there's a platform right at the edge of the screen there or is it off off from the edge of the screen there? How is anyone supposed to know in 1985 as illustrated by the clip at the start of this video? <laughs> oh, that's very, very lucky jumping there. I mean... Even here, you would not be able to make it to that magic portal restore um, if you didn't manage to jump at least one of those um, lava things there. They take too much magic off you there. 
And that's a very, very, very tough section. Easily lose one of your hags there. No wonder the game gives you nine hags. Good grief. I mean, how, how would anyone in 1985 ever get through this game, even with nine lives? It's just ridiculous. Um, potentially, the Amstrad version might be one of the, uh, the the easiest version with all these Magic Portal restores. You get more Magic Portal restores, I think, than the Commodore 64 version. And I think the Spectrum version doesn't have any at all, believe it or not. But they are shorter versions to complete. We'll come on to the other versions in a little bit. Um, but yeah. But as I say, you know, nice mode splits. You've got mode 1 at the top for the score lives. And mode naught for the main game. And it's nice that the Amstrad got its own unique version here. And it's not like a specky port. And all three versions of Cauldron are unique to each other. And have their differences. Um, we mentioned earlier that the... Spectrum Commodore 64 uses colour-coded keys for the dungeons, but the Amstrad version does away with this strangely and uses any any keys opens any of the doors of the dungeons. Um, the Spectrum is missing the magic restoring portals. We just mentioned that. Um, uh, and the Amstrad has lots of these portals in, in, the, um, in the air, in the witch flying sections and the yeah, Amstrad there's more of these portals within the dungeons as we just find find another one here um and the commodore 64 version that makes you land um well in the flying sections to get to the for the magic portals whereas the Amstrad one has a lot more of them in the air as you fly about and the platforming dungeon layouts all slightly differ from each other in the different versions hmm yeah Anyway, let's um, uh, talk about the uh, coders behind the game here um, while we're here. Um, so this was designed by a guy called Steve Brown, who, of course, went on to, to design and create the sequel to this, Cauldron 2. But more importantly, he went on to design the legendary Barbarian, which we all love, and its sequel to, less so. <laughs> um, it's believed that Steve did the graphics here. But I'm not entirely sure. It's possible that there were others at Palace Software working on the game that went uncredited here. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't think Steve was known for his graphics work. So maybe there was other graphics artists that went uncredited. Maybe the guy who did the Barbarian graphics did the uh, Cauldron graphics here. I don't know. Not sure. Not sure. But maybe Steve did do the graphics here. Um, the coder here is Richard Leinfellner, um, who also went on to code the sequel to Cauldron. Um, uh, but those, Richard sadly doesn't appear to have done any of her Amstrad games. Um, uh, he seems to be very talented, though. Uh, and it's impressive that he did the Amstrad um, coding duties here, as well as the Commodore 64 coding duties, working on both the Z80 and the 61, uh, 6510 code. Very impressive stuff. Very impressive. I think he's done a, I think he's done a really good job here. Um... Music you heard on the title screen was by Richard Joseph, um, who went on to do the excellent tunes in Barbarian, Cauldron 2, Sacred Armour of Antiriad, Stiff Lip and Co, and International 3D Tennis. And presumably he did the sound effects here, although they're rather sparse and barren, for, uh, but what you hear is pretty good. <clears throat> And what else to tell you about the um, background to Cauldron? Well, this is really interesting, actually, boys and girls. Originally, Cauldron began life, wait for it, as a licensed game based on John Carpenter's Halloween movie, believe it or not. Yeah, really. Um, however, Steve Brown just couldn't come up with a concept that worked. Um, but the whole Halloween and pumpkins kind of stuck with him. And pumpkins led on to witches. And he soon had a concept to pitch to a palace boss, um, Pete Stone, who accepted the idea. And um, we have no idea what happened to the whole John Carpenter's Halloween license, which seems such a terrible waste now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could have had a 
John Carpenter's Halloween on the Amstrad Spectrum and Commodore 64 game. That that would have been brilliant. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to have um, had a battle with um, Michael Myers on the Amstrad? What a waste. What a waste. But hey, there you go. Um, but we did get Cauldron from it. Um, so... T- t- take that uh, 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 take that as you want <laughs> if that's a good thing or a bad thing um, but yeah yeah, this came from uh, a John Carpenter's Halloween license believe it or not wow but yeah um, also, what's also interesting about this we've got like kind of a mix of two styles of game here so we've got the flying around witch shoot em up which is kind of almost Defender-esque um which was um, Lee Coder's Richard Leinfelder's preferred type of game. You know, he liked his defender type shoot 'em up. Whereas this kind of jet set willy style platformer section was game designer Steve Brown's preferred type of game. Um, but there wasn't any kind of infighting within Palace as to whose was the best. Um, for the game of Cauldron, there wasn't any fighting. There weren't arguing between each other or anything like that. Um, um, I think how it's been described over time, Palace just kind of allowed everyone a bit of time and freedom to explore and experiment um, within Palace, and uh, which is kind of cool. It's a bit of an unusual thing for a software house back in the day in the 80s just to allow people that kind of time and freedom to experiment oh notice here that the lava we can't um pick it up at the moment because we don't have the urn R- remember i mentioned that earlier so we're going to have to go through this whole volcano dungeon again once we get the urn anyway back to what i was saying palace software at, at the time allowed their developers and coders and designers they had designers at the time quite forward thinking really for palace to experiment and muck about a bit so Richard, uh, the coder, got a flying witch moving around shooting things. And and I guess they knew that coding a platformer like Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy and all the other games that had been released by other companies at the time would be sort of a fairly trivial job to do. So they... I guess they figured, why not combine what Richard had done with this section you see now, um, which is the basic stage, with... A Jet Set Willy game. And that's kind of how Cauldron came to be. And and that's... They had a unique kind of game concept then. And that's how Cauldron was born. And that's why it's a winner, I guess. And there you go. Um, and everyone was excited at Palace. And um, yeah. Uh, I, I guess that's why a good game came out of it. Um... What else did I find out? Um, Steve Brown based the look of the witch loosely on the witch of Disney Snow White. And he actually um, created a um, model of the witch from, I think, plasticine and stuff like that for the, uh, the designer to make the uh, box art and draw it and stuff. I believe he still got the witch um, in a box in his loft somewhere. Or the witch's nose fell off or something a few years back or something. Anyway, um, there's a picture of it online somewhere. I think you can find it. Um, as for the difficulty of the game, as we're trying to enter this uh, the um, the uh, graveyard crypt dungeon. Right, I'm going to go back and get some more energy before I do. I need to try and kill all three ghosts before entering the crypt and try and get in there with as much magic as possible. So we're just going to pop back here. Um, I'll talk about the difficulty in just a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little bit of a cold. Right, magic's at 97%. The magic does tick down when you're flying, but if you're walking around, it doesn't. Oh, there you go. Kill three ghosts. They do respawn, but we got in there before uh, the ghosts homed in on us. And obviously you do lose magic when you uh, fire, your, fire your weapon. You can't shoot uh, whilst you're in the um, dungeons, unfortunately. That would have been nice to do. Um, as for the difficulty of the game, Steve Brown um, admitted in an interview with Retro Gamer magazine, I, I've di- I dug it out of my archives under my desk, that they didn't play test the game all the way through. 
<laughs> which kind of makes sense. Um, only individual parts they play tested at times. And um, yes, you can tell, can't you, boys and girls? And Coda, the Coda Richard adds that they only tested the game with infinite lives on. Mm. And that kind of makes sense. But really, I mean, what were they thinking here? Now, look, where do you drop here? How do you know where to drop? I mean, look, there was only one place you could have dropped. One thing I haven't mentioned here as well, there is fall damage. You've not really seen it in action here because um, I've not fallen to my doom and died. Um, I'm going to try and do this without losing a life, and I do do it. Um, but there is fall damage in this game, so if you drop too far... The witch dies. <laughs> I hate full damage in platforming games. But yeah, that's another thing that kills you. Um, obviously, I'm making this look e maybe a bit easy because I'm not dying. But dear God, there's full damage in this game to make it even worse and even harder. I mean... <sighs> So obviously we know we need to drop to this platform here. I mean, do we drop to the left or do we drop to the right? Do we jump? <sighs> I mean, how do you solve this? I mean, you've got a flick screen platformer. I mean... I mean, this is early days of, obviously, computer games in 1985. I mean... <sighs> How do you solve a problem of this? How do you let the game, uh, the, the the player know where do you exit a screen? I guess you just need, I don't know, a, a, a long, I don't know, a long platform across the bottom of the screen with just one hole to exit. Is that the solution? Why why would that have been so difficult to do? I mean, the difficulty. In the game, it's just navigating the actual screen itself in the middle with the ghosties and spooks. By the way, I love the animation on the ghosts there. The animation on the ghosts are really, really cool. Go, ooh, the moving arms and the animation is fantastic. I love the design of the sprites, here, especially in this um, cemetery, graveyard, crit dungeon. I think that's fantastic. Love the bats. I love the uh, I love the uh, bones there as well, and the skull. Gr fantastic design. Um, so Steve's done a great job on the design of the sprites and the look of them, and the whole a a aesthetic and stuff. The atmosphere is fantastic. Just needed some in-game spooky sounds and uh, maybe a tune or something like that, just to add a little bit more to it. But. Um, yeah, I mean, why not just have like a, a long platform across the bottom of the screen here with just one hole to drop through? Why not? Why not do that? I mean, that's fine with a long, just a long uh, brick path there to walk along. That's fine. I mean, ah. Uh... It's such a shame. It's such a shame that Cauldron is just ruined by the um, coin toss of, like, which way do we drop? Left, right, jump? Or maybe just, like, a little arrow pointing, drop here. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's such a shame that Cauldron is ruined by such a flaw, such a major flaw. And that's what, yeah, that's what spoils it. It, it, it. It's it's such a big shame, and it's so frustrating. It make it honestly it just. That's why I get so angry about Cauldron because they've got so many things brilliantly done, and so right. The graphics are fantastic, really, for nineteen eighty five. It looks one of the one of the best platformers. I mean, it's a simple platformer. Simple, so, you know. So be there's beauty and simplicity. It really does look really, really nice. Okay, there's a bit of color clash going on with like the, they've not masked masked the sprites or whatever you call it, and it does clash the background. But we can forgive that. But like the design of the sprites, the animation is really, really nice. Um. It moves okay. It's not the smoothest frame rate in the world, but it, it it's more than passable. Um, the aesthetics and the um, 
the atmosphere is is fantastic. Sound effects, a bit sparse and barren. Uh, lovely music and on the title screen, but um, it, for 1985, this is head and shoulders above most games. It's just a shame. It's so let down by the um, the design of the levels, and uh, I mean, really, do they? Did they really properly play test this? I don't think they did. I really don't think they did. And it's the same across all three versions. <laughs> oh well. Oh well. Anyway, let's just move on from that for now. Um I think we could talk about maybe we should talk about the other versions. Why not? Why not? So there was two other versions of the game, as we mentioned earlier. Let's talk about let's talk let's start with the Let's talk. Let's start with the Commodore sixty four version, and I think this is what I think this was the lead development version, and it feels like there's just a little bit more extra given to the C sixty four version compared to the Amstrad and Specky ones. Now there's a really nice title screen with the animated witch appearing on it, and so the flying anyway. So the flying witch section actually scrolls. Um, but they've put the they've put inertia on the witch, which makes her much tougher to control, especially like landing her, which was a bit of a shock to me playing it for the first time. Uh, and I and I kind of struggled. And it will take a lot of practice to learn to control her, but very nice and it's fast and smooth, and with a lovely sound effect when she flies as well. And the platforming section plays pretty much just the same as the Specky in Amstrad. But they're also, um, but it's also faster and smoother. I've got to be honest. Uh, I don't think the platforming sections look as nice as the Amstrad one, um, but they're more cut. But it, but the Commodore sixty four version is more cut down and simplified, and it appears to be a bit easier. Which, to be honest, given how bloody difficult the game is, like the Amstrad one, I think that's in the Commodore sixty four's favour. Hmm. So is the Commodore Commodore won the best Commodore sixty four won the best maybe. Anyway, let's move on to the ZX Spectrum version. So this is fairly similar to the Amstrad version. Probably shares maybe a fair amount of the same Z eighty code, especially on the uh, platforming levels. Uh, but the flying sections maybe not. The sprites are bigger and move about quicker, and changing screens there's a nice scroll change of the bottom layer. But the sprites colour clash and seem to flicker a bit. Uh, but there seems to be a bigger mission here. There doesn't appear to be any magic portals to restore your magic. Both in the flying sections and in the platforming bits. So I can imagine the specky version must be like twice as hard as the Amstrad one. Uh, and the Commodore. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe the Amstrad version was done after the Specky one and they added the magic restore portals to the Amstrad one when they realised how tough the Specky one was to address the balance. Or maybe the Specky was the last version to be done and they ran out of time to add these in. Who knows? Uh, but SpectrumComputing.co.uk has the Specky release date as June 1985. And Amsterdam Action reviewed the CPC version in December of 1985. So, huh? Anyway, um, for me, uh, with Amstrad, the Amstrad's improved visuals and improved sound effects, and also the Spectrum lacks the title music. I, I, I'd go with the Amstrad version over the Specky. Um, being the uh, Amstrad being the easier game, although. You can you can complete the Spectrum version quicker than the Amstrad one. Um, looking at a, a long play on YouTube, the Specky one could be done in about twenty or so minutes, whereas the Amstrad one takes about fifty minutes because you got to go and, and do the bloody um, volcano dungeon over again. Mm. But um, overall, given my comments on the Commodore sixty four one, I'd say the Com the Commodore wins here as the best version. It just seems maybe a bit more polished. Uh, but the CPC is fairly close behind. And then the Specky version is pretty close behind the Amstrad version as well. Hmm. So there you go. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Oh, as for magazine reviews. All right. Okay. So this was, this was reviewed in the December 1985 issue 3 
of Amsterdam Action Magazine, and it got their AA Rave Award. Um, so, of course, they liked it a lot and praised it being uh, two types of game in one. Uh, liking the, uh, especially the graphics, atmosphere and presentation. <clears throat> Talking of uh, pl the platforming sections, they do complain about the difficulty of this being, uh, and I quote, made harder by the flick screens, which often have you jumping into the unknown so that until you mapped, you have to guess where a platform will be. Exactly. Yes. Thank you, Amsterdam Action. You appear to have been one of the few magazines of the time to have pointed that out, apparently. Although, they let themselves completely down by going on to say, after a few games, this shouldn't be too annoying, though. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. But they still make a final point of marking it down on finding a route on the platforming sections when it comes to the final score. And they gave the graphics... 89%, Sonics 69%, which I think is fair, I suppose, Grab Factor 93%, Stain Power 88%, with an overall AA rating of 89%. Hmm, wow. And I suppose, I guess for 1985, that's, I suppose it's about fair for the time compared to other games of the era. But as for my review, well, there is no doubt that this is a very special game for 1985. I mean, this is far and above the quality for the vast majority of games. Oh, about to collect the bones there. No, we've got the chest so we can collect the bones. There you go. Um, this is far and above the quality for the vast majority of games released in that year, as I was saying. So you have to bear that in mind and try and cast your memories back to other releases of that year, if you can. Um, thinking back there, what's the other 1985 releases of that year? You know, just have Manic Minor the year before. Beachhead was the big release of the year. Bruce Lee was like the other big game, you know. So... That's the level of quality of like the big games of 1985. If you're thinking, you know, Ghostbusters was the big game of 1984. So yeah, um, so this game really stood out both on the shelves in the shops and in your bedroom within your collection. Um, so it left a lasting impression and fond memories, I'm sure, for many of you, even if they are frustrating ones. And I suspect many of you never really progressed that far in Colgen. You probably just dicked about in it, flew around as the witch shooting bats. <laughs> um, you know, and ghosts probably picked up a key here and there and messed about in a dungeon for a few minutes and died fairly quickly and that was about it. That was kind of my experience of Cauldron as a kid. I think I bought this on budget, actually, on the Silverbird label. Um, I, I never tried to play it seriously. I mean, how many of you honestly tried to actually beat Cauldron and, you know, and took it seriously? Um, if you did, then it's a whole different, terrible, frustrating experience. And it's to be judged differently then. And I think that's how it should be judged, and not just on nostalgia, but uh, on how a game should be played as a challenge and how it's intended to be. You can't overlook game design defects and flaws. Sorry, Steve Brown. <laughs> and of course, Steve went on to a brilliant career with Barbarian and other amazing games. So I'm sure he won't be too upset with me if he's watching and listening. I mean, Cauldron is a brilliant starting point, but it's frustrating because issues of the layout of the screens and how you exit and enter them could easily have been fixed. But, you know, alas, here we are. And it could have been a 9 out of 10 early classic, given its fabulous graphical design and animation, atmosphere, and all the other things it does right. But I'll have to knock it down a few points. So I'm going to give this a 7.5 out of 10, or a 
75% score, which may seem harsh to some, but I'm sorry. <laughs> but without a screenshot for nearly every bloody screen in each of the dungeons, which I've had to use here, or unless you're one of these rare people with a perfect pho uh, photographic memory, this is nigh on impossible. So I'm, I'm afraid it has to be scored appropriately for that. But don't let me ruin your love for Cauldron if you have it, you know? Let me know what your scores are for this game in the comments below, you know? And be honest, be honest. I mean, if you love Cauldron, fair enough, you know? <laughs> uh, but be honest about it, you know? Don't let nostalgia cloud your judgment if you can. Go back and play Cauldron and see how far you get in the dungeons and, you know, you know, play try and play it properly to see if you can actually get through the game and then honestly, honestly give it a score then. Um, but yeah, yeah, that that's my score. I think I think that's fair. I think that's fair. For the time, it's a great game, but but it's a serious, serious flaws in the game design. <laughs> and here we go we've now got to go back and go through this whole um um volcano dungeon again to collect the um the lava pickup we've got the urn we got the urn from the um what was it the um crypt dungeon or the cemetery dungeon graveyard dungeon whatever you want to call it we've got to go traverse this whole thing again um, th th that will be the last item, I think. Uh, and then we can go after the Pumpkin King and get the Golden Broom. And the game is won. So kind of on the final stretch here, guys and girls. So there you go. Um, yeah. I think this was a good game to do for Halloween. <laughs> so happy Halloween, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know. If I, I don't know if I've got anything else really sort of like amazing, amazingly important to mention. Um, I just kind of wish they'd also done the um, actual John Carpenter's Halloween. I'd really have loved a John Carpenter game on the Amstrad. I really would have loved that. Actually, we do have one. I'm forgetting. We've got John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China, but I've kind of had to erase that from my memory, given how crap that was. And that's actually probably probably my uh, favourite John Carpenter movie as well. Oh gosh, there is a, I I have actually done a long playing review for a Big Trouble in Little China on the channel, so do go and check that out after this video if you want to. But um, prepare to be disappointed, like everyone else was. I don't think there's any other John Carpenter game movies that got games made of it. I'm I'm having I'm having to think now. We had there was the thing never got made into a game apart from uh, on the PC, Xbox, and PlayStation later years, and that was okay. It wasn't too bad of a game. Though I think there was a Halloween game made for the Atari Two Six Hundred, bizarrely. Hmm. can't think of any other John Carpenter movies. They Live never got made into a game, I don't think. Prince of Darkness, don't think did. The Fog, no, that never got made into a game. Christine, no, don't think so. <laughs> Starman certainly didn't. Am I forgetting, am I forgetting any of the John Carpenter movies? Probably. Anyway, enough about that. Okay, we're not too far from the end here. Yeah, this, uh, the other thing that annoys me a little bit about Cauldron is, you know, there are unavoidable hits you have to take um, from certain enemies. That kind of triggers me a little bit. I, I like to be able to... Uh, be able to like find a way to or be a, 
to be able to avoid all hits from all enemies. The mu I like to be able to find a certain a way to avoid all hits. But no, there are certain there there always are going to be certain enemies that you can never always have to take a hit from, and that's kind of a bit annoying to me. I don't know if it like triggers some kind of <sighs> hidden OCD in me. I don't know. I don't know. But hey, hmm. I find that annoying. Like when we jump, when we jump here, we are gonna take a hit from a bat there. <laughs> And sometimes moving underneath a bat will, like, that's just above your head. Sometimes won't hit you, sometimes will. So some, there's a little bit of iffy collision detection sometimes in this game. The collision detection isn't always perfect. So hmm, I feel like maybe actually knocking a, another half a point off my score maybe taking it down to 70% rather than 75%. No, I've I've said I've said I've given my score. I'll stick with it. I'll stick with it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's knowing it's only like like just be to the far right edge of that platform there to jump. Yeah. I think even with the map, it's knowing that like you had to be on the far right edge of that platform before jumping onto that screen. I think even with the map, it's still like near impossible. Like I would have landed on that lava, like <sighs> I had to look at like the um, long play videos on YouTube as well as a reference, not just the map. So I was using the map and like uh, other people's long play videos just to get through this. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It really was ridiculous making this. This was a painful, painful, excruciating vi uh, experience doing this. And... Um, I didn't really have time to practice and practice this one. So my last long play video was Super Grand, which we I finished last uh, Monday. And I went straight into doing this one. And normally I'd have a lead in time of maybe a week or two just to sort of practice through the game. Um, so I really, I kind of cheesed this one by using the map and other people's long play videos just to just get this one done in time to get this one released on Halloween for you boys and girls. Because I set myself a uh, target deadline. And uh, so every screen and er almost every jump, I had to pause, look at the map, maybe refer to um, a, vid uh, a couple of videos that was already existing on YouTube and go, where are they jumping from? Oh, they're jumping from the far left edge of the platform or the far right edge. Or they're jumping from the middle of this platform. Unpause, um, position myself, jump pause look what they're doing unpause and all that kind of stuff that's how i did it <laughs> really it it was that tedious and um but that's you know how i got through it um almost nearly every apart from obviously here this was quite obvious where you needed to jump at every time but um like when we get into the edge of the screen and and dangerous bits that's how i had to do it to get this recorded in time I mean, how was how was any kid aged I don't know seven, eight, nine, ten years old back in nineteen eighty five meant to do this? I I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know, and I'm tempted to take more points off the score. I really am. I know there's a lot of love for this game out there, and people go, "Oh, I love Cauldron," and, and I see people on forums, Facebook groups, getting all nostalgic over um, Cauldron. Hey, there we go. There's the last item. The uh, the the golden lava thing um getting all nostalgic over cauldron and i can see why i understand why and me being mean about cauldron and giving it perhaps a lower score than maybe some people would hope i would i'm probably gonna get some i don't know thumbs downs and maybe some like 
comments in the you know the, some comments going oh you've been mean about cauldron but come on come on it's <laughs> Oh, it's frustrating game design. Anyway, I, I, I've banged on about it enough. Anyway, we're near the end. We're very near the end. Oh, watch out! These, the, for some reason, these birds take off take off a huge chunk of energy. It's like 30 40 percent energy. Oh, or, or magic, sorry. So watch out for them. Just fly under the last one on the screen. Might as well rack up. Wow, down to 38 percent energy there. It's like I think that took about forty percent off, something like that, maybe higher. We can pick up this key here. We can actually just swoop down and pick that one up. Don't have to land and walk and get that one. That's actually quite an easy key to get. I think that'd be the last key we need. Cool. Lots of magic restores in the Amstrad version, which is cool. Now, before we go to the Pumpkin King, we've got to go to a little witch's cottage or hut. Mix up the ingredients. Oh, I love this graveyard and the spooky ghosts. Love the animation and graphics here. It's so cool and cauldron. So, you know, positive things. <laughs> I do wish there was like a little bit of extra sound effects, maybe some music. Uh, when the witch flies on the Commodore 64 version, when she's flying, you get this kind of like really cool kind of kind of like sound on the Commodore Commodore version, which is really, really cool. Um, shame you don't get that on the Amstrad one, but hey. That's the, uh, I think that's where, that's where the Pumpkin King lives. I think that's the final dungeon. Uh, and that, when you fly in here, the screen, uh, the area does like wrap around horizontally. So it just wraps around continuously. It's quite a, quite a wide area. I think this is where the witch's hut should be and the cottage. I love the smoke coming out the chimney there. That's a lovely effect. And there you go. That's all the items all nicely mixed up. And we can go and fight the Pumpkin King. Just abuse the flick screen there to reset the bats. Magic just tick down when you're flying, doesn't when you're in the dungeon though, thank thankfully. As I mentioned earlier. And here we go. Just go off the screen and come back again quickly. We don't need too much magic here. Now you can see the pumpkin bouncing for uh, bouncing there at the edge of the screen. He disappears off when we get too close. That's a nice touch. <laughs> and there we go, just chasing off after the bouncing pumpkin. A foreshadow there for the uh, sequel, Cauldron Two, which we defeated on last Friday's uh, Am Stream. So if you want to see me beating Cauldron 2, check out the Friday Am Stream, the Halloween Am Stream we did on Friday. So if you're not sure, if you're watching this uh, much later than this video goes live, look out, uh, just search for the Halloween Am Stream 2022. We actually got to the end of Cauldron 2 and beat Cauldron 2 with a lot of snapshot reloads. There we go. And there he is, the, the Pumpkin King. He is defeated. And we can get the Golden Broom to be the uh, Witch Queen on Halloween. Yay, there you go. Well done. Val hast completed Cauldron with a score of 17,800. The Pumpkin is dead. Long live the Pumpkin. Wow. He comes back in Cauldron too. There you go. And there you go. That is Cauldron completed. Hurrah. <laughs> Finally. Took us nearly an hour. <laughs> wow. Finally. Finally. I could put Cauldron to rest now. 
I've done a cauldron long play on my channel and I could forget about it. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so yeah. All right, I'll stick with my score of um, I'll stick with my score then of seventy-five uh, percent. Let me know why um, you 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 get this um, what what you'd score this in the chat in in the comments below. Happy Halloween, everyone! I hope you enjoy that, and I hope you have a lovely Halloween. Um, <laughs> let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you ever so much for watching. And I'll see you all again very soon. And um, and if you enjoyed what you what you've been watching recently, uh, please consider um, supporting me on Patreon and joining the Am Squad for more content and for making um, suggestions for future videos and streams and all that kind of stuff. So thank you very much. Take care all. Have a lovely Halloween. Happy Halloween. And see you all again very soon. Goodbye. Bye. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that, if you did please click a like below, leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already and over that way there's another video for you to check out, Zypho out.